Uh, thank you very much indeed for being here bright and early, and thank you, Michael, for that introduction. Thank you for uh, all getting, getting us kicked off for the Milken Institute Conference. Welcome to the ballroom, of course, where the Golden Globes are held. It's uh, standing on stage here is the closest I'll ever get to a Golden Globe, so thank you very much for uh, giving me that opportunity. Uh, I'm joined by a very distinguished panel, as they say, and uh, we always mean it, and in this case it's particularly true. Um, we have a very interesting panel to discuss, a uh, very broad topic global capital markets. Um, on, my, on, the, on my far left, most of these people don't need any introduction, so I'll just quickly identify them. Scott Miner, do you know, managing partner and chairman of Guggenheim Investments. Um, next to him, Mary Callahan uh, Erdos, CEO, JP Morgan Asset Management. Uh, on my immediate left, of course, is uh, Joshua Friedman, co-founder, co-chairman, and co-CEO of Canyon Partners. Uh, on my immediate right, Ning Tang, founder and CEO of Credit Ease, a fintech wealth management company in China. Uh, and on my far right, Michael Corbett, uh, CEO of Citigroup. So, as I say, we've got a very broad topic, um, and it's the opening session, so we can take an opportunity here, and we've got quite a bit of time, so we can take a bit of opportunity to take a pretty uh, high-altitude view of events uh, that have happened in global capital markets and the outlook for global capital markets. Um, obviously, we meet at a particularly interesting time, 2018 uh, started off with very, very high hopes uh, for the world economy, for global markets generally, coming off a very strong year in 2017 around the world. We entered a year in which global growth is now uh, expected to be the fastest and sort of synchronous global growth that we've had in a decade, certainly since the financial crisis. Uh, markets seem to reflect that, and uh, parts of the world, like Europe and to some extent even Japan, that are been rather stagnant for the last uh, 10 years, have actually seen accelerating growth uh, and improving prospects. It's been an interesting, um, somewhat turbulent start to the year, because that all was taking place against the backdrop of rising uncertainty about geopolitics, concerns about whether we were entering a new period of uh, trade uh, tensions, trade disputes. We've seen an interest, we've seen uncertainty about the outlook for interest rates, obviously monetary policy, the removal of quantitative easing, the kind of uh, interest rate, uh, the, the monetary accommodation that we've seen for the last 10 years. And sure enough, it's been, as I say, a fairly bumpy ride the first few months of the year. On top of that, we've had issues involving the tech sector, obviously one of the key drivers of growth over the last 10 years or so. So to um, so so impose some kind of analytical and narrative discipline on this broad picture of global capital markets, I thought we'd start off talking about these trends, these market trends that we've seen the start of 2018 and where they might go from here. But I also want to talk about structural issues. There's a lot going on structurally, deregulation, big changes, big trends in uh, the nature of capital flows and the types of uh, capital markets that we've seen, rise of passive investing, um, big regulatory changes <coughs> to the way that uh, banks and other financial institutions work. So we'll start off talking about the global trends. And I want to start with you, Michael, if I may. Um, as I say, we, we've, we've had a, uh, we, we're at a, at a time of, um, what's expected to be continuing strong global growth. Markets certainly in 2017 anticipated that global growth. Um, we are still expecting, obviously, a, a steady reversion to a more normal monetary environment, interest rate environment. And we've had these concerns about geopolitical tensions. As we stand now, four months into 2018, where do you, where, where, where are these trends, how are these trends playing out? How are these various cross currents playing out? And how do you see the outlook broadly for, um, for, the, for the global economy in 20, for the rest of 2018. Sure, thank you, and good morning, everyone. You know, I would um, <clears throat> I use a highly technical term when I describe the world today, and I'm gonna take the glass half full and we'll get the, the panel engaged, is the world's okay. And if you think about where we are today, and a couple things you touched on is, is one, we are, I think at this point, 106 months into this recovery. I believe it was June of 2009 where the market bottomed here in the US. And what was interesting in that 106 months, it really wasn't until the second half of 2016 that not just in the US but around the globe, we actually started matching or exceeding expectations of what growth should look and feel like. So what I mean by that is for uh, much of the time, we'd come out and prognosticate on growth and design the forward future curve of what growth would look and feel like, we consistently underachieved. And it wasn't until the second half of 16 that we actually started to achieve and in some cases outperform. And clearly uh, 2017 was the first full year 
of growth either matching or exceeding expectations in most of the economies in the world. Second piece is when you, you talk about that synchronous growth that's there, uh, you, really for the first time in a long, long time, we actually don't have a, an economy of any significance that is actually in or really uh, at or near or really threatening in any way the state of recession, at least you know, in the near to, to intermediate term. I think the third piece uh, I would look at is that when you think of central bank policy, and one thing obviously that we're watching closely as you talk about the transition uh, back to a more normal stance in terms of monetary policy is some of the stability. And whether it's the appointment of Chairman Powell, whether it's the reappointment of Governor Kuroda, the stability at the Bank of England, uh, we will be managing a transition in terms of the ECB. But what we see is we see governing central bank bodies that are likely to remain consistent around the stance that they've taken. And so we shouldn't see any uh, significant curves uh, in the road. I would say that the next piece, and certainly here in the US, is that when you look at the drivers of economy, in the case of the US, the US is about two thirds driven by consumers. When we think about the consumer here in the US, what do we really focus on? We focus on housing and jobs. And we can argue a little bit, and Josh will probably opine a little bit on housing prices later on, but housing's pretty good. And when we think of jobs, we're you know, at a, uh, a long time low in terms of, uh, of unemployment. And I would say the final piece uh, I'd throw out there is uh, things going on like tax reform. And I would argue that the benefits of tax reform aren't yet fully into our economy. And my own belief is I think they're not yet fully appreciated in terms of the intermediate impact they can have. So you know, as you, you look around the world from an economics perspective, a reasonable backdrop. Thank you, very much, Michael, that very good summary. Um, Mary, if I could turn to you, um, uh, and I do want to come on, I want to talk spe specifically about China and about other parts of the world too. But let's look particularly at, at the US just for the moment. Um, as Michael said, we are now nine years, just about nine years into this expansion. That makes it uh, the second longest expansion already, I think, since the Second World War. Um, seems to be set fair probably to become the longest expansion. Normally at this stage of a, of a business cycle, you are seeing, you would expect to see all kinds of imbalances, perhaps. You might see financial imbalances of the sort, perhaps not on the scale that we saw 2006, 2007, but, but certainly those kind of risks are rising, or normally the, the typical pattern is, you know, inflation is rising and forcing monetary policy makers to raise interest rates, and that causes, um, that causes the economy to slow down and ultimately recession. What are the, as you look out right now, as I say, at this, at this unusually, uh, unusually lengthy expansion, what, what other, we, we don't seem to have significant imbalances of the sort that have derailed expansions in the past, but, but are, there, are there things we should be concerned about that, um, that, could, that, that, that will bring this to an end? Well, hopefully it won't bring us to an end, but um, there's lots of things we should be concerned about. Longevity is not one of them. There, there's nothing written that says that any kind of expansion has to end. There just happens to be past data that shows us that maybe it's seven year cycles on average, et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's nothing about what we're going through that history has ever written before. So by definition, you can't take anything in, in, the, in the books and say, how do I apply it? Which is why all the big data in the world isn't gonna get us to answer the question that, that you have right now. Everything that we're going through is unprecedented. $11 trillion of global quantitative easing, completely unprecedented. An entire reform of the banking system around the world. US banks, just as a data point, when you think about the buffer, which is the sort of safety zone, less than 20% of the banks before the financial crisis had a 4% or greater buffer zone. 90 plus percent of the banks in the United States of America are above that 40% buffer zone. Money markets have been completely reformed, which was sort of the trigger point um, post Lehman of what was happening in, in the marketplace. We're at a 44 year low in unemployment in the United States of America. Michael just went through how the entire world was synchronized in global growth and especially over the past sort of 16, 18 months with Japan and Europe kicking in, emerging markets having really nice growth. You have the US consumer, you asked specifically about the US, so we bank half the households in the United States of America through uh, the Chase side of J.P. Morgan Chase. The consumer has never been stronger. The, the um, income 
continues to go up because you see that wage inflation every, every month uh, trickling through. You see their debt ratios, you know, auto lending is up nicely, but not in a way that's going to um, sort of drown the consumer. C uh, the mortgage lending is up, the, the student lending is down, the ability to pay their bills is in, a, is in a great state. And then, oh, by the way, just as Michael said, now you take a completely unprecedented tax cut to the largest economy in the world, and you try and calculate that all together, there's, no, there's just no way you know. So you have to sit and you have to use nothing about the past to be able to predict the future, and you look for all the things that people aren't worried about. It's not the geopolitical, I mean, there are lots of geopolitical risks, don't get me wrong, but generally speaking, if you look back in all of history, the only geopolitical issue that has ever affected markets, which is what this panel is about, was the 73 U.S.-Israeli problem where you actually, it wasn't, the, it wasn't the geopolitical issue itself, it was the oil price and then the hyperinflation that followed and the stock market um, decrease that ensued. Otherwise, every single U.S. invasion of a country, Russian invasion of a country, martial law in Poland, Korea war, everything that you've had has never had a long sustaining impact on the market. So our jobs, all of us here collectively, are to sort of listen to it, incorporate it, and then put it to the side and really focus on the underlying fundamentals, which, as Michael said, couldn't be stronger. I mean, I suppose, Scott, if I may turn to you, taking a slightly longer historical view, you could argue, I mean, Mary, what you say is right, but you could argue that political geopolitics has certainly uh, influenced outcomes when, for example, the world has seen a resurgence of nationalism. Um, you know, I'm not suggesting we're necessarily going to be like the 1920s or 30s, but the kind of <coughs> economic protectionism associated with uh, the US, Smoot Hawley, uh, in the late 1920s and what followed there, and of course the general climate of nationalism, that, that, didn't, that didn't end well um, for, for the world. Scott, what is there? Mary raises these geopolitical concerns and says they're not, that, that, you know, the, the world in the last 30 years at least has not really been, uh, the markets in the last 30 years at least and the economy have not been badly affected by it. Is that, is that basically right? So, so when people worry about a trade war with China or a trade, you know, with entering, a, the, there's a US delegation gone to China, going to China this week. We've got this deadline for tariffs uh, tonight being hit on aluminum and steel. Uh, we've got this rising protectionist rhetoric. Is that something that you think is the world can just shrug off? Well, you know, Gerard, when you get into these worlds of, of, of the unthinkable, you know, to think that we would have a trade war like we had in the 1930s, um, there's a certain cognitive dissonance in the market. And that is that uh, psychologically, when people are faced with the prospects of circumstances which are disastrous, they tend to just discount them and ignore them. You know, we went through something very similar here in the United States with the housing crisis. The numbers were very clear. And, you know, when you looked at, at how overleveled the household sector was, when you looked at um, uh, the incredible overvaluation in housing at the time, and you started to run the thing in reverse, if housing prices began to fall, this was unthinkable because it would lead to a financial crisis of biblical proportion. And so therefore, the policymakers basically, and the market basically shrugged it off and said, oh, this will never happen. And of course it did happen. Um, <clears throat> I, however, you know, I, I, I differ with Mary to some extent because I actually see a lot of excesses building up in the system. Uh, Mary mentioned one of them, the size of global central bank balance sheets. Uh, but you know, in addition to that, you look at uh, corporate lending. Uh, corporate debt to GDP is at record highs. Uh, and uh, with interest rates rising uh, in the United States, uh, the effect on free cash flow on corporate America over the coming years after we get past this surge from the tax cuts uh, is going to uh, become more and more of an issue uh, in, you know, in the 2019-2020 period. Uh, you know, in addition to that, I look at, at uh, labor and immigration in the United States. Uh, we are starting to reach chronic shortages of workers in key parts of our economy. For instance, in housing, there's a shortage of drywall hangers, of framers, of painters, of rough carpenters, uh, even to the point where I was speaking with a developer the other day, and he said the way he gets labor is he goes to some competitor's development 
and he asks, has somebody ask, what's the labor rate for a drywaller? And they'll say $30, and he goes, okay, I'll pay 35. And literally, the people lay their tools down and move to the next project. Mm. So, um, you know, we, we are, are in the United States coming uh, uh, to a point where the stimulus fiscal policy, which has been uh, put in place from Washington, uh, is colliding with monetary policy and uh, some of our other policies around immigration, uh, which are going to lead to a breaking point uh, somewhere here in the not too distant future. But you know, as I like to remind uh, you know people, uh, all of Guggenheim's clients are long-term investors. Uh, it's just that I have only discovered that in their mind, the long term is the next quarter. Uh, so, uh, so they're not really focused on this yet, uh, but, uh, but investors should be getting focused on this because uh, I think we have some serious issues ahead of us. Uh, you raised a good point about labor market shortages. We at the Wall Street Journal, we had a story, uh, uh, you talk about dry wool. We had a story a couple of weeks ago about a city in Indiana, Elkhart, Indiana, which has an unemployment rate below 2%. Now, I think where you have things like signing on bonuses to work at McDonald's and uh, things, I mean, it's become, I mean, the, the, the tight labor market is a real issue, especially associated with immigration. Josh, if I may ask you, uh, both Mary and, and uh, Scott make this point about Central bank balance sheets. Um, we have seen this extraordinary expansion of central bank balance sheets in the last 10 years, associated, of course, with low interest rates. We now do seem to be in uh, a period where that now seems to be in the phase where we're getting some normalization that's being rolled back. Certainly in the US, raising interest rates, slight trimming of the balance sheet. You're seeing trimming of the balance sheet uh, eventually in, with the ECB, Bank of England, BOJ. This, is, well, this has been an astonishing monetary experiment, which most people would probably agree has been you know, broadly effective in, in terms of keeping, you know, in terms of helping at least the economy through the, through the consequences of the financial crisis. But as we see that stimulus now withdrawn and we see this normalization of monetary <coughs> policy and to some extent of interest rates, you know, what, what can the world expect? How can we expect to transition to that um, in a relatively smooth and uh, non-disruptive way? I guess what I would try to distinguish is between the health of businesses and their earnings and the fundamentals of the economy compared to necessarily how the financial markets perform. Mm. If you looked at 1994 as an example, uh, rates were rising, uh, earnings were terrific. Corporate earnings were up quite substantially and the stock market was sideways and the bond market got destroyed. So this can happen again. Um, and it can particularly happen in a situation where notwithstanding um, continue economic exp expansion, et cetera. Markets are, are creatures of moods. And, and uh, right now we've had a tremendous amount of inflows into relatively uh, passive types of vehicles. The percentage, for example, of the high yield market that are ETFs and mutual funds um, has skyrocketed in the last five years. And the percentage of high yield that's held by uh, commercial banks and investment banks has dropped to nearly zero. So structurally, you have a very different market. All the, all the risks that used to be on the, on the balance sheets of the banking community um, have been taken off those balance sheets and they've been cast elsewhere in the system. And when you start to remove the punch bowl and you start to see rates go up, that self-reinforcing mechanism where um, flows come into a mutual fund, they buy a bond, which is hard to buy and illiquid because the banks aren't making markets any longer, therefore causes the price to go up, therefore everybody's happy, therefore they put more money into that fund because it did well and this continues to go till it doesn't. And when it doesn't, it unwinds in a really ugly way, particularly given the illiquidity. Um, and, and so far, that's actually been pretty manageable. We've actually seen some outflows this year um, and the high yield market is, is flat to marginally up this year. Um, in the beginning of 2016, we saw what happened when rates started to move up and the Fed had started to raise rates at the end of 15 and people were worried. There they were more worried about deflation and oil prices and so forth. Mm. But there was outflow from those, from those 40 act funds selling into an illiquid market and the, and the bond market dropped maybe six points, the high yield market. Um, I think that can easily happen again. When, when you look at financial institutions, um, if, you, if you go through enough cycles, you realize that, that mismatch assets and liabilities is really a dangerous thing, particularly combined with leverage. We don't have the leverage in the system, but we do have the mismatches. They just aren't on the balance sheets of the commercial banks. 
So, so I think that the financial markets, and, and by the way, this is as true in equities as it is in high yield debt. Mm. Um, you see a lot of complaints about how difficult it is to execute on trades in the equity market, much, much less liquid than it was uh, before. There's sort of a fast speed, slow speed. Yeah. Uh, is that because of the decline of public companies and the decline of the free float? I mean, is it because of you know, regulatory environment? But you're right. You're I, think it's, I think it's all of the above. There's a lot of passive trading that takes place at the beginning of the day, then it stops. But I also think you, know, you have half as many public companies as you used to have. Right. Um, I think the number is something like 8,000 down to 3,800. Mm. And, 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 and that may just be a phenomenon of when you try to regulate, this is again one of those um, sort of unintended consequences of regulation is when you make it really hard to be a public company, you make it easier to be a private company. And we've got private equity companies all over the place. They don't necessarily want to deal with Sarbanes-Oxley. They don't necessarily want to deal with all the same regulatory structures they have to deal with as a public company. And oh, by the way, if the debt markets have enough people who are desperate for yield, the spread between lending to a private company and a public company is almost non-existent. Right. So it makes the traditional efficient capital markets that we're used to in, in some ways less efficient much more prone to volatility. Mm -hmm. And I think we can expect some of that going forward. Thank you. Um, I want to do want to come back to some of those particular things, particularly with regard to regulation and the impacts it's had on things on, on liquidity, um, especially the bond market. But uh, Ning, if I may turn to you, uh, China's obviously been key driver of key contributor to global growth over the last 10 years. Um, you know, even as it slowed down, it's been the principal contributor to, 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 uh, to incremental global growth in the last 10 years. Um, we have seen, however, again, a lot of changes in China, regulatory changes, concerns about the um, about leverage uh, in the in, in in real estate, but across the economy more generally. We've seen the Chinese authorities becoming much more aggressive about reining back both lending, both in the bank and the non-bank sector. We've seen them <coughs> being more aggressive in terms of capital outflows and becoming much more restrictive about capital outflows. Give us a picture of where, and yet China continues to be obviously, you know, six six percent, more than six percent growth continues to be a key driver of the global economy. How do you see China uh, navigating these challenges um, that it faces in its own system in the next couple of years? Yeah, uh, Michael just uh, told you that uh, the world is okay, and I'm going to tell you China is okay. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, yeah, uh, you probably have heard about uh, the term uh, new era. China is entering uh, the new uh, era. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, for me, it means, uh, first of all, uh, it's about uh, the new economy. The, un the new economy is actually driven by China's uh, 200 million middle class and uh, 2 million uh, high net worth, ultra high net worth uh, individuals. These people, need a better quality education, healthcare, all the services uh, uh, industries <coughs> are doing uh, very well. And uh, uh, for high-end uh, uh, clients uh, we have, they send their kids to US, other parts of the world for better education. They come here for treatment, healthcare related, so on. And also, you talk about uh, small businesses uh, and uh, micro entrepreneurs. They are all uh, wired up. Yeah, uh, digital transformation is very key for Chinese uh, uh, small businesses and uh, big businesses. So on uh, our uh, like uh, high net worth, ultra high net worth, uh, yeah, uh, clients, uh, yeah, uh, they are successful entrepreneurs making money uh, from uh, uh, traditional industries like uh, uh, manufacturing, importing, uh, exporting, uh, real estate, and so on. But uh, what are they thinking about today? They are thinking about, one, how to digitally transform their businesses. Two, how to do global asset allocation, not just investing in China, but uh, investing globally. Three, how to think about uh, inheritance, how to pass on their wealth, their value system to their next generation. This is the single, I think, very interesting moment in mankind, human history, that so much wealth has been created in such a short period of time, now it has to go to the next generation. And these two million people 
haven't learned from that, from their parents who were very poor to begin with. So I think, uh, you know, in the new economy, driven by middle class, high net worth, and also by technology applying to uh, small businesses and uh, 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 big businesses all alike, I think it's very strong. I think uh, another observation is that uh, the new economy is asking for a new financial system where the past several decades you see banking dominant uh, financial system in China is going to shift uh, to more direct investment, capital markets, venture capital, private equity, all these kind of like uh, uh, financial elements supporting long-term development, supporting innovation, supporting technology, because you cannot expect uh, a tech startup to pay you dividend every quarter to give you money back uh, after two, three years. It requires eight, nine, ten years, even longer company building, which requires patient capital, long-term investing. This is very new to Chinese investors and regulators. Yeah, so people, and Scott uh, talked about like, uh, you know, here investors are long-term, meaning uh, a quarter, right? In China, long-term meaning same day. Yeah, so uh, uh, how to uh, uh, really make the investment uh, community really longer term, really understand the, the importance of asset allocation. You know, I think you guys uh, can play a key role. China is opening up, right? So I will see you more often in Beijing, in Shanghai. Yeah, and uh, lastly, I think uh, the new financial system, the new economy, you know, all the bottlenecks can be really addressed by utilizing technology. Yeah, by utilizing technology, middle class can do investment through their mobile phone. Small businesses can borrow through their mobile phone. We work with Amazon, with eBay, PayPal to enable small businesses to borrow through mobile phone. They don't need to have physical kind of hard assets. They just give us their transactional data, their option, uh, operational data. We can lend to them real time. This is like unheard of, like a great uh, consumer experience. So I think a technology can make all this new financial system really happen in China. So I think China is pretty good, more okay. than okay. Okay. So China's okay. The U.S. is okay, the world's okay, <laughs> equities are okay, fairly valued, <laughs> bond market seems absolutely fine, we're going along with this expansion. Um, you know, I, forgive me, I'm a journalist, so it's kind of, <laughs> I have to play the role of uh, the, uh, the skunk at the, uh, at the picnic. Um, so let me, Michael, if I may, try and find out what might possibly, possibly not be okay, okay. Um, or might even, at some, some point, might not be okay. Let me talk to, you mentioned about the... Um, you know, half glass full, half glass empty. It always reminds me of the very final stages of uh, uh, a British government that was uh, in the process of collapsing. And somebody went to the Prime Minister and said, how do you see things? And he said, well, I can simply see the glass as being one-tenth full rather than nine-tenths empty. Um, <laughs> so not that, we're, not that we're in that position right now, but let me, let's talk about this, this, these issues of the, that are on people's minds, trade in particular, and what we're seeing, as I said, you know, you look at the Wall Street Journal headlines today, you've got this aluminum steel deadline, you've got this uh, uh, delegation going to China, you've got um, all kinds of rhetoric <coughs> rising about, uh, about trade. This clearly, and, and, and by the way, when, when the administration has come out with some of these measures, that does seem to have led to uh, market dislocation. How much, and, and yet, at the, again, to take the optimistic view, as important as trade is, we're talking about very sectors of the economy that are still really, really small in, in, in terms of their overall significance. How, <coughs> how concerned should we be about what the specifics, not the, more, the general picture, but the specifics of um, what's going on right now between the US and China? How, how much, how, how, you know, China's, China's said it, it's willing to retaliate. Um, how concerned should we be about escalation and how, how this could escalate and what it could mean for, 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 for global markets? You know, when we, we've spent some time talking about monetary policy and the economics, I think in the world today, you really can't simply look at the world just through that lens. I think you're forced to combine the lenses of economics, politics, and societal challenges. 
And to me, when I look at trade, and not just trade US-China, but global trade, global trade to me was the logical next target around a quasi-protectionist mentality. And what, and what I, I mean by that is when you, you think about the world, and I was very struck, I don't know, it was five, six, seven, eight years ago, I was traveling around the world, and uh, you know, in my travels, I'm fortunate to meet a lot of interesting people, and I noticed a change of rhetoric in particular as I visited uh, some emerging markets in other countries that typically I would go, they'd talk about growth and all the great things going on. And the shift was very, or the focus was very much shifting, not to growth, but it was job creation and wage growth. And if you look at what's going on in the world and, and some of the protectionist things around immigration, and you think about trade, you know, trade goes back as long as mankind, modern day trade, and the US's interest and the, the advanced economy's interest in terms of the proliferation of global trade was driven from a self-motivation. The rest of the world grows, we will grow faster. And I think what we've seen is as the rest of the world has grown, growth isn't what we'd either like it or expect it to be. And therefore, we start examining what some of our trading partners are doing, and it's moved logically to a place where, or it's moved not surprisingly to a place where we've got a big imbalance. And that imbalance is a $560, $570 billion trade deficit in the United States today, $375 billion of that with China. Two-thirds of our trade deficit is with China. And when you think about what's there, it's also logical because when you think of people's perception of the economy and, and things they fear, we not only fear uh, China and China taking our jobs, we fear, uh, we fear technology. Uh, we fear income inequality. And trade today has become the label or the focus in that. I think what's important in trade to, to really drill down into is that when we look at trade imbalances, what's driving them? So, you know, when, when we did the work, and again, City has a, a big history in terms of trade and our over 200 year roots, 1% of the US economy today is driven by agriculture. 19% of our economy is driven by manufacturing, and 80% of our economy is driven by services. So what Ning says that resonates with me is in this economy that's moving forward, China from a standing start 10 years ago was nowhere in services. Today their economy is 52% services. I think in the US, 1% of our economy's agriculture, I don't see it moving. In the manufacturing piece, McKinsey and many other smart places have come out and said of the manufacturing jobs today, 40% of them have the, the chance of being automated in the next 10 years or beyond. Likely not gonna change that. So the real nexus is at the services point and how do we, and how does the global economy get along in terms of having the right balances, not protectionism, but the right approach to the, the balance of intellectual property rights, of uh, the import-export of services. And again, drilling into those numbers, while well, we've got a $570 billion trade deficit today, we actually have a $250 billion surplus in terms of the exports of services. And so I think you really need to get granular here and, and you know, we've seen protectionism just not work historically. And Mary, I think, yeah. you, um, you know, it's a $570 billion deficit. Um, the president is very focused on these bilateral trade deficits and seems to be very keen to reduce the bilateral trade deficits. But do they matter? Does it really matter if the U.S. is running? Yeah, but <coughs> just exactly what Michael said. I just want to keep drilling down because he said it's all about the details, right? So what's the headline? The headline is greatest percentage tariff increase in the last 50 years, okay? They don't fill in the next sentence. Off of the lowest base in the last 100 years, okay? So it's where we're starting from is really important. $350 billion, $250 billion trade deficit with China, 275. When you actually take what U.S. subsidiaries in China are selling in China and what Chinese subsidiaries in the US are selling in the US, okay? Let's just take General Motors as a for instance. Right before the crisis, 
General Motors made three million cars in the US, a million cars a year in China. Over the last eight, 10 years, we've had nice growth in the US, so we've grown 20% cumulatively. We sell 3.6 million cars in the US. They've grown 300%, they sell four million cars a year in China. That hits the capital markets. So again, the separation of these geopolitical issues versus the capital markets. That $250 billion trade deficit with China, when measured on those terms, which Wilbur Ross has tried to get to, to the heart of the source of where it's made, goes down to about $50 billion. So it matters very much how you get into the details of these and what it means for US and China and if you sat in the ante room before we came out, Ning would have told you, this is super exciting. It opens up lots of stuff. Much more trade, dialogue, everything will happen. As a matter of fact, some things may accelerate with the rhetoric that's happening and the nervousness to get things cut and done uh, before anything does happen. So I, I think, and each industry matters very differently, but I think there are gonna be some very strong end game winners and some end game losers, and it's all gonna matter on how you play that out in the capital markets and the, and the stocks and the bonds that you pick to, to be able to benefit off of that. Uh, Scott, you could argue that the last 40, 45 years we've seen one of the greatest um, periods of liberalization, global liberalization that we've seen, in, you know, certainly since the period before the First World War, let's say, and you know, liberalization of, 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 tra of trade in goods and services, liberalization of capital markets, uh, liberalization even of, of, of people, of movement of people, mass migrations. Uh, setting aside these particular disputes over right now over aluminum or over steel or over the bilateral trade deficit, it does look, doesn't it, as though that perhaps for political reasons, for broad cultural structural reasons, maybe that period of you know, con almost continuous liberalization has come to an end. I mean, do you agree with that? And if, and if so, what are the consequences? Well, uh, well let me put it as I'm, I, I won't say that I agree with it, but I'm extremely concerned about it. Um, the the uh, perceived imbalances of growth in the world, uh, because we have seen great nations like China emerge uh, and become world powers, uh, is threatening. Uh, in a lot of ways to the established uh, leaders. And um, uh, yet at the same time, there is no doubt that the emergence of China, as an example, uh, has had a very positive influence on the quality of life in the United States. Uh, the availability of um, manufactured goods in China uh, has reduced their costs here and increased our standard of living. Uh, now, some will say that's a threat uh, because that's taking workers, taking jobs from American workers, but yet you know, the United States is a, is a dynamic economy which has created lots of new industries over the last 30 years. And uh, you know, the jobs that we see today, for instance, in Silicon Valley, at uh, Google or any other number of firms, were completely unmanaged 30 years ago. And so, uh, you know, my view on this is that um, uh, we are risking a, a number of things, and especially as Americans, we are risking a number of things. Uh, first off, um, uh, there is a reason why the United States has a structural trade deficit. And the reason for that is because the world wants to hold the dollar as a reserve currency. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, the demand for dollars overseas, for investment, for capital, for all the things that it functions as, which enhances our quality of life, which reduces interest rates here, which elevates our stock market, uh, is actually something that accrues to our benefit. Uh, if we get to the point where we insist that we can have no trade imbalance, then what we are basically saying is that we no longer want to be the reserve currency for the world because there is no way to pump the dollars into the world unless we do it through trades and services. Uh, that um, has very broad strategic implications for us on not only an economic level, but on, on a defense level uh, and, and on a quality of life level. Uh, that means that uh, if we wish to continue down that path, uh, that Americans will slowly surrender 
uh, their standard of living, uh, that, uh, uh, that we will ultimately uh, become a second-rate power, uh, and that we will cede uh, our position of military superiority in the world to other nations. So these are very serious consequences to the policies that, that could go badly for us if not well managed. We'll come back again to issues particularly on, on the dollar and capital flows. But uh, Josh, let me ask you just quickly. I do want to talk a little bit about growth. Um, we've got used in the last 10 years since the financial crisis to um, lowered expectations for growth in, the, in, in you know, what we used to call the West in the US and, and Western Europe. US, you know, es estimates of trend growth in the US have gone from two and a half, two and three quarters down to maybe two, uh, perhaps even lower. A year ago, President Trump came in and said, no, no, that's not true, that's defeatism, that's kind of, um, you know, that, that's, that, 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 that doesn't reflect the great potential dynamism here, comes in, big tax cuts, um, growth does seem to have picked up a bit. What, what do you think the US, do you think that that lowered rate of growth is still essentially uh, right, still the trend growth, or do you think the US can actually go back to the kind of rates of growth that we saw uh, in, the, in the 1990s, for example, or even perhaps even going back further beyond that? Um, Michael and I had a funny conversation about this um, in Switzerland in January, because the president was shooting for 7% growth. So um, <laughs> citing China and India as a couple of examples of large countries with large growth, <coughs> never mind, the starting point is relevant, however. Yes. Um, yeah. uh, I, I guess um, I think that there are a lot of things that can interrupt growth, and, I'm, and I am more concerned maybe than some of the other panelists about some of the fragilities and instabilities. And I think beneath the surface of growth, you have to look at where the growth is from, and there are certain industries that are decidedly not growing and other industries that are growing. And when you have those big disparities between what's going on in certain industries and what going, what's going on in other industries, it does produce political processes that are, at the very least, very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And if the, obviously, if you have growth rates that are being um, accelerated by deregulation, by lower taxes, by repatriation of capital, by capital expenditures that are being treated uh, favorably in the tax code, so they're being accelerated, those have a way of, 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 of fixing a lot of issues. And economies such as the U.S. economy that generally are free market types of economies, while they, they have a lot of discomfort along the way in specific sectors, they generally adjust pretty well. Mm. Um, all the predictions about technology increasing and unemployment immediately skyrocketing um, have proven so far at least to be totally wrong mm. because jobs have been created, unemployment is down, and labor participation is finally actually increasing. So, so far that's actually worked out pretty well, but it does concern me. And yet there are demographic factors, right, that have also been suppressing growth in the U.S. and in Japan, obviously, and in some extent in Europe. But, you know, setting aside 7% growth, which would perhaps be nice, it's, it, you, you would agree that the U.S. can probably do better than one and three quarters, 2% growth. I absolutely agree they can, but I also think there are things that can interrupt it. And I think political processes can easily interrupt it. Um, and I think if you, if you reverse to policies that are not pro-growth policies, you'll have slower growth. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that the, the sectoral imbalances that take place along the way create those political pressures. So it's a delicate balance, and I think one that can easily go off, off kilter. Uh, Ning, from a, to, I want to talk about, as we said, some of the structural issues that we're facing, um, some of the big structural changes. China, you mentioned a little bit earlier, has been going through that. You have a, a, a new economic leadership to some extent in China since the People's Congress. Um, uh, at the end of last year, um, what are the? Tell us a little bit about what the, chi the this new Chinese leadership is trying to achieve as China transitions to this somewhat slower rate of growth, more consumption-led, uh, less export-dependent uh, growth. What, what, what are they? And, and of course, addressing some of these imbalances in the financial system. What is this new Chinese leadership trying to achieve over the next uh, five-year period? Yeah, um, if uh, we look at uh, uh, the 19th uh, Party Congress, uh, yeah, uh, what uh, the Congress said uh, is uh, quite clear. Um, the uh, Chinese economy, uh, Chinese enterprises uh, in the new era will be uh, driven by uh, technology, will be driven by innovation, uh, will uh, seek uh, sustainable development, um, as opposed to uh, really uh, like uh, uh, traditional uh, ways of uh, growth. 
And uh, uh, so I'm quite confident uh, that um, uh, the uh, whole country, the whole economy is uh, uh, going toward uh, uh, that direction. And also, uh, uh, put that aside, uh, let me uh, add to what uh, uh, some of the discussions uh, uh, you know, we just had. I think I'm quite confident about uh, um, the US uh, leadership uh, in the context of uh, China emerging. Uh, because one uh, uh, is about uh, innovation. Yeah, uh, each time uh, I come to the US, uh, we have an office in uh, Silicon Valley, San Francisco. I really enjoy the uh, uh, tremendous innovation uh, taking place uh, here. It's a great sunshine. Probably that's a key reason uh, why a lot of innovation uh, is happening uh, in this part of the yeah, country. And uh, secondly, I think uh, some of the issues that uh, US is facing or US and China are together facing and the new leadership uh, of China is trying to address is that, uh, you know, how to uh, share the pie, uh, distribute the pie more fairly uh, uh, between China and the US and also in the US context, uh, like uh, the upper class, middle class, lower class, uh, how to uh, share the, the, the pie because the bigger pie is a uh, result of our joint effort, right? And uh, so I think uh, this issue is uh, widely uh, known and what's good about the US is that uh, all the issues get surfaced pretty quickly. And furthermore, many, many people, all kinds of organizations, including Milken, try to address them. Yeah, this is very good. You know, if you have like all the smart people, all kinds of organizations, government, non-government, think tank, uh, enterprises, trying to address some focused issues, I think you'll see uh, pretty good progress. And I think China is doing the same. Probably as we speak, uh, they are in the high gear negotiation somewhere uh, in uh, the suburb Beijing. <laughs> yeah, so I'm hopeful. Mary, let me ask you about some of the structural changes um, here. We talked a little bit, but I'd like to hear a little more about it. The shift from active to passive investing. Um, what, you know, what, what, is that just a function of the economic cyclical trends that we've seen over the last 10 years and um, some of the things also that, that, that Josh was talking about? Or, or, I, mean, I mean, how deep-seated is that and what implications does it have for this is for, for, for wealth management, but more broadly for some of these questions over uh, capital market flows. So if you take $11 trillion and you throw it at the markets, what do you think you're going to get? You think you're going to get the whole thing just moving together. It's a little bit like Los Angeles real estate. <laughs> like, the whole thing just moves. $5 million houses go for $100 million, and they were $5 million just a couple of years ago. So it's just like the, the market doesn't, just doesn't discern this. And... Um, you, made a com you made a comment about the volatility, and volatility is going to come back, and that could, that could unravel things. That, that's, that's not going to unravel things. That's going to just go back to normal. So there, Scott and I are on the um, Fed's inter, uh, investment advisory board together, and just last week uh, we had a presentation from one of the largest hedge funds uh, in the world come and talk about volatility. And here's a stat I didn't know. Maybe you knew it. Volatility, on average, and again, there's a lot of things that aren't average anymore, but on average, one to two times a week in the past, the stock market would have a plus 1% move, either way, okay? One or two times a week. In the year of 2017, there were eight of those days. Eight, period, in the whole year. There was no volatility, none. So the whole market's just moving in sync. And so you wonder, you ask the question about passive versus active, like what the heck is active gonna do for you? The whole thing is, first of all, not really moving right. in, any, in any kind of uh, differential manner. And so now you're getting to the point where you're seeing volatility. Now here's the greatest fear that I have. Not that it's gonna unravel the markets. It'll weed out the bad, bad picks, it'll, it'll end up, you'll find your way through the good thing. It'll really affect the people who are still psychologically damaged from 2008. And there are so many of those people that say, I can never, ever go through that again in my life. I'm in cash. And then you get this nice market that's enticing them to come back. They put a little bit back. And now you get 2018. Everyone fears going over 3% on the 10-year. What's that going to mean? Is it going to unravel everything? You start to get some volatility, maybe once or twice a week again. And people say, that's it. 
I can't handle it, I'm out, like a week like last week or two weeks ago. And they just say, forget it, this is too complicated. So you're getting passive, but then you also might get passive exit from the marketplace. Then what you get is the people who don't have the right retirement in the future, which is really what we're all about here, which is making sure that we're all investing money for the long term so that the people who need it have what they need by the time they exit the workforce. And so my greatest fear is that volatility hits it the wrong way. Now for me, overseeing the asset management business for J.P. Morgan Chase, it's the greatest time ever, right? All of a sudden, you go back to our analysts believing that it, it really does come down to the work um, that gets done on, a, on an active basis, which is you look at CEO A and you look at CEO B, and you say, if I look at Mike Corbat and I ask him, what's he doing before the tax cut gets enacted? And he tells you, I'm doing this for the employees, I'm doing this with the foundation, I'm doing this with uh, buybacks and dividends, I'm doing this with one-time bonuses, and he's got a plan, and you go to CEO B, and they're like, not sure yet. <laughs> you know exactly how you're going to invest in the future. That's all, that doesn't come from a I robot. I think that was a recommendation, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. <laughs> well, I'm ask, let me ask Scott, what's driving this, this, this renewed volatility? Is it just a reversion to, as, as Mary said, does, does it, Mary was talking about it, normality. Is it a kind of a reversion to a normality? Or can we expect to see this continue, or are we going to go back to the kind of remarkable low volatility environment we had last year? Well, well I think it's two things. One is uh, I, I think the volatility is going to pick up. Uh, I think it's the, the receding of global liquidity. Um, you know, as we go through quantitative tightening in the United States, as the ECB is sort of slowing down its purchases, uh, and even the Bank of Japan is tapering despite what they say, um, this huge amount of liquidity being taken away from the market, which I think has muted volatility and made it uh, a much more boring world for people like me or for Josh, mm -hmm. uh, the um, yeah, I think this is going to increase as, as the uh, monetary authorities continue to move away. The, the thing that I'm concerned about, which is sort of the, the corollary to what Mary's talking about, is, is a sudden um, uh, discontinuity in the market. Uh, and I think a lot of that would be driven from passive investing. Mm. Um, you can see uh, the peculiar uh, way in which securities are trading. Uh, for instance, in the high yield market, uh, Toys R Us went bankrupt last year. Um, that security was trading within 2% of its par price up until about six weeks before the bankruptcy, and then it fell by 80%. Now, what happened? Toys R Us didn't go out of business in six weeks. What happened? Uh, you know, my hypothesis is that the, the security was removed from the index, which is used for passive investing. Is that a rating agency problem? Well, the rating agencies had already been, been downgrading Toys R Us. It was the, I think, the sudden removal from indices that caused the, the passive investor to suddenly say, I don't own Toys R Us anymore, I'm selling it. Right. There was no credit decision, there was no analysis, it just happened. Now, so it can magnify, it can actually mag magnify the, 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 the movements and the volatility when you get into Right, yeah. and then yeah. when you layer this into uh, the, the growth of passive investing over the last 10 years, especially in areas like exchange traded funds, uh, where you have uh, people who are just throwing money uh, at sectors based on passive investing, uh, and you find out that a lot of the underlying securities in these exchange traded products are less liquid than the exchange traded product itself. Mm. So for instance, if you buy an ETF that invests in bank loans uh, and you uh, want to sell it, you can get your cash back to borrow as an investor. As a guy who manages bank loans, it will take at least two weeks to get cash for these bank loans. Mm. So you can see where if suddenly uh, there is some abrupt discontinuity in the market where you have a, a crisis of confidence uh, in uh, a peculiar uh, sector of the economy, sort of like we did in the high, in what happened with energy uh, yeah. two years ago, you could see an abrupt run uh, on, on uh, these types of securities and, and we could have a liquidity problem. Josh, you mentioned, and I just want to touch on this a little bit more, the decline of public markets, the growth of private markets, you know, decline of number of public companies, the growth 
in alternative in investments. Is that something that's just going to continue? Um, can we expect that trend to accelerate? Or again, is that something that we, where we might, we, we, we might see a change there? Is there something that you, I, you, you, could see, you could see some reversal? Certainly, um, deregulation helps restore public markets. There's mm -hmm. no question that some of the privatization has taken place precisely because of the fact that it's more difficult mm -hmm. uh, to be in the public domain. In addition, things like uh, the Volcker Rule, for example, um, where uh, people, uh, banks, you know, buy something and then they have to figure out later on if it was okay or not. Mm -hmm. um, and, this, and, and then you have different regulators telling you different things about what, how this is supposed to be interpreted. There has to be some certainty about mm -hmm. these things. Otherwise, you're going to simply get a withdrawal of liquidity provision by financial institutions that are regulated. And that is exactly what's happened and has happened clearly in the debt areas and has happened in the equity area as well. So I think if you get more clarity, if you continue to get some deregulation, I do think this could maybe mean revert a little bit. But meanwhile, the amount of capital that's been accumulated for privatization is enormous right now for, for taking things private, as a US sense of privatization. So, so those are countervailing factors. But I, I would expect it to maybe return a little bit more to the mean. But I'll tell you, right at the moment, um, it's very clear why many companies don't feel like accessing the public market. It's simply life is easier. Right. It's even easier to raise capital in the private market in, in, in great swaths of the and economy. And liquidity in the private markets is incredible. I mean, simply partly because of the scale is actually addressing well, what has been a, traditionally one of the biggest challenges for in the private markets, right? Well, the, the private market liquidity has gotten better <coughs> and the public market liquidity has gotten worse. So there's, yeah. Been, yeah. <laughs> there's the, been some convergence. You've talked about banks and I want to ask, Michael, you've gone through 10 years of um, some very aggressive bank regulation, some eye-wateringly tight regulation in the last year or so, you know, obviously under the Trump administration, we've seen a considerable relaxation of that across a number of fronts. Are we, are we, in, are we I'm, sure as a, I'm sure as a CEO of a major bank, you probably don't think there's any danger that the pendulum is going to go too far in the other direction, but how would you characterize it right now? I mean, are we, you know, is, is this move back towards a slightly, um, uh, you know, kind of looser hand on capital and on some of the other measures that this administration is talking about? Is that, is that moving, moving in the right direction for you? Yeah, I would, I would actually phrase it slightly different, that, that we really haven't seen much of any repeal or move back in terms of regulation. But I think what we talked about going in, and I think you've heard fairly consistency from the industry, we're not saying for Dodd-Frank to go away or regulation to simply go away. A lot of these things were put in place for the right reason. But the most important thing that really has happened, at least from what we see from our perch, is the tone from the top has changed. Meaning that, uh, you know, again, we deal with our, our, our regulators uh, quite a bit. They've got tough jobs. But the, the, the historic lack of willingness to accept or believe positive intent has changed in terms of coming through. We've got a lot of people working very hard to make sure that we as a company, we as an industry are compliant, and that tone has changed. I think part of the challenge and likely why things have moved a bit slower is the time it's taken to get people in the seats that we're going through and I think about to be finally finishing a complete evolution of the chairs or heads of most of the, the major regulatory bodies. And in many cases, it takes unanimity or it takes at a minimum a, a considerable quorum to change some of these things. But I think the work that was done by um, Secretary Mnuchin and the Treasury staff in terms of the papers, the white papers that they put out and some of the things that are being contemplated, I think are actually quite logical. We've got a couple of minutes left. One, one topic we haven't talked about is technology, financial technology, changing technology, and how that's going to change the way all of your institutions work and the way money tr works more generally. Um, at the end of last year, whenever you went to a conversation with anybody around the world, there were only two things they wanted to talk about, Donald Trump and Bitcoin. Um, uh, Mary, your boss had some very uh, famously robust things to say about Bitcoin, so you can feel free to contribute if you want. But... Ning, I thought I'd ask you, China is really in many ways at the forefront of some of these changes in financial technology. I mean, how is that, how is that changing? You know, obviously from a consumer perspective, we're seeing it change. We're seeing the rapid introduction of the blockchain in all kinds of areas. How is it changing? How, how is it going to change global capital markets? Yeah, uh, China and the U.S. are two largest and uh, uh, leading uh, fintech markets. And uh, I think the whole financial system will become more comprehensive uh, uh, with uh, fintech. 
yeah, now small businesses, consumers, uh, even rural people, not too many rural people in the US, but a lot in China can benefit from high quality financial services. I think that's tremendous. Mm. Yeah, Any I, thought you may yes. I, uh, We don't talk about Bitcoin at our company anymore. <laughs> <laughs> we talk about blockchain, which is incredibly important to the whole system. But I, 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 don't, I think for, for this audience, and because they're just way beyond the, uh, the general rhetoric, the, I think the single most important thing that we all should worry about from a risk standpoint for, for everything that we do is technology. And when I mean technology, I mean cyber is just every single moment worth of everybody's risk. And it's not the release of your name and your password and your social security number because all of that is 100% out there and for public availability. So don't kid yourself in thinking that you've changed your password and nobody knows it. All of that is known. What we all need to worry about is the complete control that the more we lean into technology, the more you, it, it can, it can, you can hijack your whole life. So forget about the grid, which everyone's worried about. Forget about the financial system, which everyone's worried about where the money goes. What happens when they take over things that happen in your home? What happens when they take over your voice and instead of you sending out what you think you're sending out, it sends out other things? How, how, do, you, how do you pull that back? The, the cyber warfare in this world is completely unknown, uncontemplated, and has to be grasped as we think about where we're going. Thank you for that. Just, Scott, any final thoughts on particular? I mean, I don't want to leave it on such a, I don't want to send people away on such a terrifying note as they all go and, <laughs> as, as they all go and immediately check their, their smartphones. Well, well the, uh, you know, I, I do think crypto assets are going to be more and more of a yeah. challenging from a regulatory standpoint. But one place where we're focusing, and I think it's going to play a much ro larger role, is artificial intelligence. And Guggenheim is really at the cutting edge of artificial intelligence because I am the perfect example of artificial intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> that is definitely the perfect note to end this morning's discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking our panel. That was great. That was excellent. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you very much.